excited to be here. And I too would like to thank Bob and Julie and all of the organizers of the conference. I think we should have a round of applause. that each of you being here is incredibly important. You, each of you, is part of the transformation occurring on this planet, and I'm so grateful to you for being a part of that. I know you're doing important work out in the world. So I hope that today I may spark some new ideas, inspire a little troublemaking in the sense that it upsets the dominant paradigm, freeze our friends, the animals, and freeze humanity from the chains that bind us, both seen and unseen. I'd like to illuminate some of the blocks on the path to creating a vegan world so we can clear the way for a radical restructuring of our society based on embodied love. Do you all want that too? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, it can be a little louder here. I guess I shouldn't, shouldn't yell into the microphone. Okay. So, um, before we get started, how many of you, if you're vegan, please stand up. <laughs> we need it to move, did we? Yeah, it's fine, it feels good. Okay, now put your hands down though, this next question requires raising your hands, so I need to see the hands. Okay, how many of you are feminists? Wow, we have a lot of people, fabulous. So a lot of you obviously know what it means to be a feminist. So that is great. So um, you can go ahead and sit down now, and I appreciate your participation. I hope that you're feeling good, getting the blood pumping in your body. So um, feminism is simply a movement to end sexist oppression. It's an emancipatory theory. It's a belief in the social, political, and economic equality of women and all genders. And that's really all there is to it. It's pretty simple. It's not so scary. A lot of people think it's like the bad, the big bad F word, right? I know I'm not a feminist, but I believe in X, Y, Z. People will say this all the time about how they believe in freedom for women and um, gender issues, but then they won't identify as a feminist. So ecofeminism takes it a step further and it sees the connections between the oppression of women, animals, and nature. And the overall goal of ecofeminism is to create a harmonious world. So we're going to touch on these intersections today. So um, another thing is that feminism is also about giving credence to the work of women and to the many foremothers that came before us in the vegan world. So we've been talking, we've been hearing about Peter Singer, right? How many of you could tell me the name of the author who wrote the book Her Land, which was a vegan utopia written in 1915? Right? Okay, well her name was Charlotte Perkins Gilman and um, I recently discovered her work and she's amazing. So this is really about understanding women's involvement and valorizing the qualities that we tend to associate with females. We'll delve more into that later. Right now you're probably thinking, what is she talking about? Okay. So basically feminism and veganism are both liberatory philosophies that go hand in hand. You will not create a vegan society if you do not address the gendered hierarchy which valorizes violence against women and animals. So let's look at some examples of veganism today. So I think everyone in the room said they are vegan. So what are some of the qualities that you wish to see? You can just shout them out popcorn style. What does veganism represent to you? Compassion. Compassion. Justice. Equality. 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 Love. 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 My favorite. Okay, what else? Respect. Respect. Freedom. Freedom. Integrity. Integrity. Mm, integrity. Peace. Yes. Peace. Life. What was it? Sustainable. Right, sustainability. Beautiful. We could go on and on, right? These are all, I agree, these are all things that need to be a part of our movement right now. So settling for sexism, death, and destruction, and flesh eating is not a part of what I envision for humanity. Yet that's what a lot of our modern animal, so-called animal rights or vegan campaigns represent. So the question is, are we really putting the liberatory principles of veganism into action from start to finish? Or are we promoting a watered-down ethics? 
Many of us suffer from a lack of faith in what is possible because we've been following a patriarchal model for social change, one that is limited in its creativity and vision. Some vegan organizations say, don't worry, veganism isn't a whole new worldview, it's just a dietary choice. Don't worry, veganism doesn't relate at all to issues like racism, classism, or sexism. In fact, the underlying message often says to men, you can have your veggie burger and beat women too. Overall, the message is often, well, we don't really believe liberation is possible, so let's just appeal, meet people where they're at, appeal to them on a superficial level. If they want to eat free range, we see that as a step in the right direction. No, wrong. Veganism is a whole new paradigm. Veganism is a radical notion, and that's why it has not been achieved yet. A true vegan ethic that is grounded in respect for all beings, that is truly liberatory, is actually quite subversive and quite scary to many people and their limited views of the world. The past few thousand years of patriarchal domination have not really created anything new. It's just been a cycle of escalating violence, and death, and destruction. So I'm calling for a new paradigm. If vegans understand how domination of animals, women, and the earth are connected, they will see how the cultural stories about power, the body, emotions, and empathy are all related. And this empowers us to then change that story, change the paradigm. Surface solutions bring superficial results. True transformation comes from a creative imagination. We must be willing to dare to dream, conceive anew, and take consistent action toward achievement. So I put this slide up because it shows a vegan campaign that promotes sexism to try to sell veganism, and a second one which links veganism with concern for factory farms. So the first one is boyfriend went vegan and knocks the bottom out of me. We don't have a lot of time to spend on these. Um, obviously it's problematic. Then the second one is about, um, it's talking about, imagine how the farms used to be. Well, that's not how factory farms are today. But the truth is that farms were never a happy place. Farms are never a great place for the animals. So using the word factory farm tends to confuse people. So I know it can be a little bit confusing trying to understand with all the messages we get about uh, humane needs and these campaigns like Proposition 2, which I myself worked on and it helps me clarify my ideas. But um, basically it's, it's kind of confusing. Some of us think, well, I can work for welfare reform but still be a, an abolitionist at heart. So um, I've put these two different ideas into two different uh, columns. I hope you can all read it. But basically, on the right side, I've listed out the underlying beliefs of welfare reforms, and on the left side, I've listed the underlying beliefs of veganism. So working for complete freedom, a vegan world, and working to add a few inches to the cages of tortured animals, those two ideas are diametrically opposed. You can't work on one and then say that you're still working for the other. So let's look at Proposition 2. I know some of us, um, I, my friend who worked on it with me just walked out of the room, but anyway, some of us who are abolitionists and do have these deeply held beliefs about veganism still got sucked into the Proposition 2 campaign, even though it wasn't really in alignment with our beliefs. So what happened there? Why did that happen? It, it like, had all this energy, and all of a sudden we were like, yes, we're going to win for the animals. And it was like, what are we going to win for the animals? Supposedly, a few more inches in the cages? They're, they're places of torture? No, that's, that's ridiculous. But why did it gather so much energy? Why was it something people were so excited about? Well, because we don't have faith. There's a lack of faith in what is possible. So I'm here to remind us that radical change is possible. Creating a vegan, compassionate world is actually a radical shift in relationship. Because whether or not a society uses animal products depends on their relationship with their own body, their pattern of relating to their own thoughts, and their foundational beliefs about relationships. Do they believe it is okay to harm another if it benefits them? It is, is it okay to restrict the autonomy of another sentient being just because you can? Does might make right? Well, most of our cultural stories say it does. Therefore, creating a vegan society is actually a complete shift in worldview. So, 
What is required is a radical approach. Rad means root. We need to get to the root issues. You can't get people to stop using animals if you don't change the foundational worldview and pattern a relationship that created it in the first place. Uh, one of the terms I forgot to mention back here was use abuse. I like to use the, that term, use abuse, to emphasize that when you use an animal, you do abuse them. So if you hear me speaking and you're like, what's she talking about? Use abuse is what I'm saying. Okay, so the use abuse of animals is a symptom of the dominator paradigm. So the dominator paradigm is a term coined by Rianne Eisler that describes the nature of patriarchy, which is the society we live in. The foundational worldview is domination. It's the might makes right mentality. It's the idea that we have to fight to get by, a belief that the world is cruel and you have to fight to survive, that we look at others with a sense of competition and reductionism. Basically, it's about adversarial relationships resolved through violence. How exciting. There's another mode of being. Instead of the dominator paradigm, we have the potential to move into a society of partnership, compassion, care, community. One in which we look at another being and ask, how can I help you? How can we create mutually beneficial relationships? And how can we both successfully coexist? There are enough resources for everyone on this planet. It is just a matter of shifting to generosity, compassion, and partnership. So we can't impose a vegan ideal on a society that is foundationally violent. We have to change that foundation. We must identify, uproot, and eradicate the destructive, unproductive beliefs and behaviors of the dominator paradigm. So you can, in, a, in simple terms, you've probably heard this before, but you can think of it as how we're looking at power. Is it power over, or is it power with? Because true power is in relationship to others. When we connect with our bodies, love, compassion, and kindness comes to us naturally. But we've been living cut off from this inner wellspring of peace and beauty. So part of creating a better world is to heal this disconnection so that we can operate from a place of wholeness and integrity. I call this state of connection to one's body's wisdom embodied love. It is the love and care that springs forth naturally from every cell of your being once you clear away the mental and cultural constructs that get in the way. The golden rule, treat others how you want to be treated, which is veganism simplified, right? That golden rule is actually vibrating in every cell of your being. We are designed for cooperation. That's why when you stub, or let's say that you see someone else stub their toe, and in your body you're like, ah, or you see someone else get hurt, right? It, it actually hurts us to see others suffer. Anyone who's human, we all know this is empathy, we all feel it. It's obvious. It's just that as vegans we've extended it to the other animals. But um, science has now verified this with something called mirror neurons that demonstrates that when you see something happen to someone else, it feels like it's happening to you too. So if we see others joyful, we feel joyful too. This is the law of karma. It helps us when we take better care of others, when we relate in a loving, kind way to others, it benefits us. So when we're connected to our bodies, kindness comes naturally to us. Therefore, as activists, we have to bridge the gap from people's hearts and their minds, help them reconnect to the love and empathy that is already there naturally. So if it's already there, What's stopping us from accessing it? Well, I call our way of operating in the world disembodied logic. So instead of operating from empathy and embodied love, people are stuck in their minds. It's a set of justifications, rationalizations, mindsets, stories, and beliefs that give rhyme and reasons why we do what we do. Disembodied logic is a learned state of relating and being it explains away your feelings and gut reactions and empathy and keeps you stuck at the level of the mind. It intellectualizes lived experiences so you're unable to access the embodied love that we talked about is vibrating in your cells. Most of us are enculturated to avoid feelings. We're numb. In fact, the 
reality of what is done to animals is something very scary for us as humans to face. It is so out of alignment with our highest potential as empathetic beings that we must enact elaborate stories, logic, and justifications to keep ourselves out of our feelings. To really see, feel, and bear witness to the atrocities of the dominator paradigm often feels too much to, pay, to bear. Because we're empathetic, it hurts us to see others suffer. And so that's why we have the disembodied logic that we use in this culture. That's why we have phrases like, animals are here for us, I love animals, while well, they're eating, a, eating an animal. Chickens are stupid, humane slaughter, free range. All those words, these are all refrains in people's minds that prevent them from connecting with their feelings. It's logic, it's reasoning, it's disconnected from your heart, from your body. And most people live their lives at the level of disembodied logic, using the mind to continue in avoidance and denial of what is true to the body. That violence inflicted on animals actually hurts us, too. So, remember that use of using animals arises out of foundational beliefs and cultural stories about what is. Our beliefs about what is are taught to us through a dualistic gendered hierarchy. I know this sounds like a mouthful. But basically, we see the world, we construct our world through pairs of opposites. These dualities link together and simultaneously degrade women, animals, emotion, the body, and nature. The dualistic hierarchy links together and simultaneously valorizes, gives credit to men, humans, rational thought, the mind, and culture. And then it degrades everything on the other side. So you can take a look through and you'll, you can think of how this operates in your world. Um, basically the mind is seen as master of and superior to the body, just as men are seen as masters of and superior to women, just as humans are seen as masters of and superior to animals. <coughs> Excuse me. The mind, transcending the body, logic, control, efficiency, right, and males are all up on a pedestal as reflected in our language and the cultural constructs and symbols. Things associated with the male set of dualisms is a set of what's good, what's correct. That's why the word right is associated with male. As a good girl in Sunday school, I memorized that uh, he was seated at the right hand of the father, right? Because everything that's right is correct, and it's all had a thing to do with male. Male authority, these things all represent the ideal, the norm. Male is neutral. If I tell you to imagine a person, most people imagine a male. When the gender of someone is unclear in writing, we default to he, because male is the norm. But this is erasing at least one half of humanity, and then, you know, a lot of people don't associate with either of those genders, so it's really erasing a lot of people. The world is set up from the view of the male, and even as women, we construct our realities through the male gaze. This is because the dominant group of people dictate the mainstream meaning, language, and belief systems in a way that reinforces their standing. So, on the female side, we have the body inhabiting the body, feelings, cooperation, honoring natural timing, and women. These are all down in the dirt. Now notice I said the male principles are up on a pedestal, the female are down in the dirt. Because the dominator paradigm is about being high, above, removed from the earth. And this is why we torture and kill animals. Because it's about separation. It's about control. And the idea, and you'll see this throughout everything, once you, once you understand this duality, you'll start, you'll start to see this everywhere in the world. That we are taught to believe that women, animals, and nature should all be controlled. They're unruly, they're wrong, a lot of our insults link women and animals together. And um, this is why, for example, we have violent bloodshed is seen as a good thing, right? We have war, we have killing of animals. So violent bloodshed, when, when we purposefully, we, you know, we kill someone or we harm them and there's blood pouring out of the neck of that goat, for example, that's a good thing. But when there's blood flowing out of a woman naturally, menstruation, 
that's taboo. That's awful, right? We need to clean up that mess. And even the advertisements on TV for it, you've got the blue, the little blue liquid. Um, can't even make it red. <laughs> Because basically anything associated with women and with nature is needs to be cleaned up, it needs to be controlled, and this is all connected to how we relate to animals. So one of the one of the dualities you'll see is mind and body, like we were talking about earlier. Embodied love, when you're connected to your body, you're naturally in your empathy and your compassion. When you're in the disembodied logic, using those justifications, thinking you're not really connected, you're rationalizing away your feelings. So there is a way to integrate these two. But in general in our culture, we think of mind and body as separate, mind is superior and master to the body. So this is the problem, because bodies do matter. Um, these associated dualities tend to reduce beings to their body parts, and then it treats those bodies like objects in service of those with more political, social, and economic power. The wholeness and integrity of the body is erased. So freeing animals depends upon freeing ourselves from body-denying belief systems and engaging in practices that gets us into our bodies instead of evaluating how we measure up. From an ideological perspective, we cannot achieve animal liberation if we don't revalue the body and teach new behaviors, new narratives, and beneficial ways of relating to our own bodies. In the dominator paradigms, ideological traditions, religious traditions, and philosophies, the body is sinful. It's the source of dangerous desires. We need to rewrite this story. The body is good. Instinct is good. It is where our empathy and our compassion reside. Efficiency, logic, the mind, these are all valuable things. I'm not suggesting we do away with the things associated with the male side of duality. However, we have to take a look at how this duality plays itself out in order to create a world that values cooperation, the body, feelings, women, all people, all genders, the earth, and all of her inhabitants. If we want to create a vegan revolution, we must honor the female and all the qualities associated with females. The qualities that a vegan ideal embodies are compassion, care, love, nurturing, emotion, sensitivity, all things generally associated with females and therefore devalued. So we must be brave as activists and claim our compassion, claim our courage, claim our sensitivity, claim our connection to our feelings. So here we are at the Amazing World Vegan Summit. Julie, I see you back there. You weren't in here earlier. I was saying thank you for everything you did to organize this. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. It's been really fabulous. And I think that metamorphosis, complete transformation is what we're really after, right? We all want complete transformation. Yeah? Okay. So how do we create that change? Basically, there are two options in life when it comes to creating change. You can live by default and allow things to happen to you, or you can be the architect of conscious change. This is true on both the collective and personal level. As vegans, we are attempting to conceive something new. Conception requires introspection, reflection, contemplation. It's not all go, go, go. It's not all daylight. You need the darkness. It's about engaging in practices that allow the chaos of the mind to settle so that the truth can come to the surface. You need the stillness for the creative solutions to come forth. If we as vegan advocates really slow down and listen to this new paradigm that wants to come forth, I know we will be successful. Change is a process. It requires that it requires that quiet incubation time, connecting with the sacred darkness, the stillness of night. Sometimes when it appears that nothing is happening from an outside view, there is magic and growth alive in the seed beneath the earth. A new paradigm requires taking the time to slow down and listen to the creative spark the quiet voice within, like the snake shedding her skin, 
It's about rebirth, taking off the layers, new beginnings. We must release outmoded paradigms, antiquated stories about humanity, release the ideas that hold us back about what we are capable of. And most importantly, it's about visioning, conceiving anew. The moment now is ripe with potential for this new paradigm, and its creation starts with you. Thank you.